Our next presenter is the founder and creative director of the informational blog cider, the, the Planter. She holds a bachelor in communications and biology from Florida International University and, and is currently a master's degree candidate in pharmaceutical nanotechnology from the University of South Florida. I want you all to give a warm welcome to Dami Oshidi. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Come on down. Um, yeah, so we're going to be talking about nanotechnology and basically how medicine is going to be changing in the next couple of years. So there's three objectives that I would like to cover. Um, the first objective is the introduction to nanotechnology. So what are, the, what are nanoparticles and some characteristics that are really important in how they work? Um, objective number two, the general therapeutic applications of nanotechnology, such as targeted drug delivery systems, regenerative medicine, nanorobots, and gene delivery. Third objective is the future of medicine. So current types of medication on the market now, and then the future possibilities of nanomedicine. Introduction to nanotechnology. So a lot of people ask me, what do I study? And first I tell them nanotechnology, because when I say pharmaceutical nanotechnology, everybody looks at me like, what are you talking about? And when I say nanotechnology, everybody says, okay, what are nanoparticles? What is nanotechnology? So to make it quite simple, it is the creation or the manipulation of materials to a nanoscale. So taking either a large object and putting it to the nanoscale, which is in nanometers 10 to the negative ninth, or taking smaller molecules and building them up to that scale. And then there's always a discussion about the size. So what is considered the size of a nanoparticle? If you read different research articles, some will say it's one to 150 nanometers, one to 350 nanometers. But according to the FDA, in order to be considered a nanoparticle, it is one to 100 nanometers. And these particles, they can vary, again, in their size, their shape, their color, and then their surface area. So then this figure is gonna give you a comparison of the size more of nanoparticles and how small they are. So as I said, it's in the size range of 10 to the negative ninth nanometers. That is one billionth. They're very tiny. They're usually tinier, tinier than viruses. Thousands of them can fit into red blood cells. Um, they're 100,000 times smaller than a strand, a single strand of hair. And the only thing smaller than a nanoparticle is atoms, which we cannot see. And if you want to get a comparison of the size, you can think of it as holding an orange to the size of the Earth. That's the scale that we're looking at. So they're very, very <coughs> tiny. So then another question that I get asked is, where can I find them? Do they just come out of nowhere, or do we make them? How do we find them? So the first area, or the first place you can find them is in nature. So you can find nanoparticles in gold. You can find it in volcanic ash, in grapefruits, milk droplets, ocean sprays. You can find nanoparticles in nature. The second area that you can find nanoparticles is, or to create them is in a non-intentional way. So if I light a fire, and through the friction of that fire, I can create nanoparticles that will come up in the fume. Or if a construction worker is making something, he's welding something or creating something with a, a structure, through that grinding and through that friction, nanoparticles can be made. But it's not intentionally. It just happens so through our actions that we're creating these nanoparticles. But then what we're really looking at is intentional. So this is where we engineer those nanoparticles for a particular purpose. We're creating them from either taking them from nature or whatever action that we're doing in order for them to have a specific purpose. And we can manipulate them to do whatever we want to do, which is the cool thing about it. You can take the nanoparticle and just engineer them so whatever purpose you have for them, they can carry it out. So then this is more important, the characteristics of nanoparticles, because once you kind of understand this, you understand a bit more how they work. I mean, there's so many different characteristics to them, but I want to focus just on two. But at the small size, physical characteristics of material change. This is due to the quantum effect. As the size of material changes, so can its characteristics. So basically what that means is if I take something that is something that I can see, like my gold earring, I can see it now, it has a certain characteristic. It's gold and it's still. 
but if I reduce it now to the nanoscale, it has a different type of characteristics. And I'm gonna stick on gold for a little bit because I think it's a very diverse type of nanoparticle. So, like I said, gold, we can see it as yellow. If you see my earring now, it's yellow. But when I reduce gold to the nanoscale, it can range in different colors. It can be red, it can be blue, it can be yellow, it can be green. It all changes depending on its size. And why this is so useful is especially when we're trying to find tumors within the body. We can use those nanoparticles because they give off a of fluorescence if we look through um, you know, a certain bioimaging system. We can use the nanoparticles to find cancer. So if we're wondering where cancer is in the body, we can use nanoparticles to target certain receptors for cancer. And through that, they'll emit a certain light. So we can now identify that this is where the cancer is in the body. And then another cool feature about them when it comes to their size is they have the ability to move. If I take my gold earring now, it doesn't move. It's, unless I move it myself, it doesn't move. But if I reduce it to the nanoscale, if I shine a light or a laser where, that, where the they say where the cancer is, I shine a light, this can cause the nanoparticles to oscillate back and forth. They'll start moving back and forth. And this is useful again because let's say that nanoparticle is infused inside the cancer, cancer tumor. It can cause a friction within the cancer and then cause the tumor to abrupt. So we've only targeted at this point healthy cells rather than, or cancerous cells rather than healthy cells. Another important characteristic of nanoparticles is their surface area. So the smaller the material, the surface per mass material increases, which causes higher reactivity. So if we look at object A, it's just one big circle. We look at object B, it's breaking up a little bit more. C, it's even smaller, but D is really what we, what we want. So I'm gonna compare A and B. Let's say I infuse uh, nanoparticle A, that big circle, with some medication because you have res a respiratory problem. That particle is only gonna reach a certain area within the lungs. But now, imagine if I take the same amount of drug and it's now infused into those smaller particles. Now, that drug can reach a larger amount of surface area, which because it can reach a large amount of surface area, there's more reactivity. There's more ability for the body to reabsorb the medication faster than if I just target this one, it only can reach one concentrated area. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about surface area. You're gonna see why it becomes important later on, but those are two characteristics that I find that are really, really important, why nano, nanoparticles are so efficient. So then I'm gonna get into the general applications of nanotechnology, um, but before I do that, I wanna show you a video to kind of give you a better understanding of what I'm talking about because nano, nanos, it seems so futuristic, you may not be able to picture what's going on, but hopefully this video will get a better sense of what I am saying. Cancer cells isolated from human tumors can be used to help the development of novel cancer therapies. For most drugs to be therapeutically active, must go inside the cell. Nanoparticles carrying drug payloads can be used to facilitate the drug delivery. Nanoparticles can be targeted to receptors that are overexpressed on the surface of cancer cells. They then enter the cells via a process called endocytosis. Antibody fragments engineered on the nanoparticle bind to the receptors, initiating the internalization process. Inside the cell, clathrin proteins form a cage around the developing endocytic vesicle, which is then cleaved from the cell membrane. The newly formed vesicle carrying the nanoparticle travels further inside the cell, where it is captured and fuses with an early endosome. So that was kind of, or that was an example of targeted drug delivery systems. So I just wanted to kind of give you 
something that you could see, like the possibilities of nanomaterials. So again, I'm going to be talking about targeted drug delivery systems, regenerative medicine, nanorobots, and then also gene delivery. So when it comes to targeted drug delivery systems, um, in order for it to have come about, there obviously had to have been some issues with our current um, drugs now. So there's three main issues that come about with drugs on the market right now. So the first one is solubility. Um, more than 40% of the drugs that are, that are on the market are not soluble in water. And this is a problem because, is, because it causes an issue with absorption. If the drug is not being able to be in a state that it can be absorbed, then the medication is not effective. The second issue is poor bioavailability. So lack of proper circulation of the drug causes, again, a poor absorption of the active pharmaceutical ingredient. So the drug now is not able to circulate through the body properly because there's different environments in the body, either high amounts of acid, um, de degradation by enzymes, uh, gastro, gastro juices. There's so many different things that are blocking the drug from getting to where it needs to get to. So again, when the, when the drug that we're using now is trying to get to, let's say, the lungs or inside the brain, the drug has already been degraded. So by the time it gets there, the concentration is so low. So that's why we continue to have to give a patient more doses, more up, up the dosage more, because for some reason, the concentration that we are intending to get to where it needs to is not reaching. And then there's a poor pharmacokinetics um, issue, which has a negative effect on the body. So we can break that down into absorption, bioavailability, distribution, metabolism, and then excretion. So if the drug is not being metabolized properly, it's not being absorbed into the body properly, it can't work. And then if the drug is staying too long inside the body or not long enough, it's ineffective. So this is going to be our model of a nanoparticle. And I know there's like a lot of things on it right now, but I'm going to focus on three particular characteristics that are revolutionizing um, medicine. So the first one is targeted ligands. So a ligand can be an antibody, a peptide, or a protein. And what that does is it allows for a higher binding uh, affinity. So in order for the nanoparticle to reach, let's say, cancer, right? Cancer has certain receptors, or cancer gives off an antigen. We can design the nanoparticle to have a particular antibody or a ligand to then target specifically that receptor. That's how nanotechnology is very specific. It only, we can target it to reach only one type of receptor or the different amounts of receptors that we are targeting for. So then it's going to go directly to that cancer and then have its therapeutic effect on those cancer cells, leaving the healthy cells alone. The second feature is the cationic nature of nanoparticles. And this is really good if we want to get into the DNA. So eventually, nanomedicine is going to help with, I wouldn't say editing genes, but um, affecting our genes in a way that's going to help our bodies uh, last a little bit longer, do things a little bit better if we're having defective genes. So what nanoparticles are going to do is because they can be highly positive and DNA is highly negative, nanoparticles are then going to reach the DNA, neutralize the DNA, create pores in the DNA, and allow it to um, release its drug load or its genetic material. The third aspect or characteristic of nanoparticles are synthetic coatings. So like I said, there's a lot of issues with the circulation throughout the body. Um, it's being degraded here. The lysosome is degrading it. Enzymes are degrading it. But if we coat these nanoparticles with with the synthetic coatings such as PLA, PLGA, and PEG, this is going to protect the nanosystem, which is then protecting the drug. So by the time we get to the lungs or the brain or wherever it is that we're trying to get to, the concentration is kept. It's not, it hasn't been destroyed before it gets to the designated area. So I've already listed some advantages, but more advantages with this system is that they can carry hydrophobic drugs past the membranes, the barriers, and water-soluble environments. So if we go back to biology, if we look at a membrane, we have a hydrophilic head, which is water-loving, and a hydrophobic tail, which is water-hating. A lot of these drugs are not able to bypass the membrane because they're highly hydrophobic. 
But the way that these nanoparticles will be set up is it allows the drugs to bypass the membrane, and then the drug has easier access getting to where it needs to inside the cell. Then we can increase the stability of the drug within the body. Again, because we're protecting the cell with all those synthetic coatings, or we're protecting the nanoparticle with the synthetic coatings, we're allowing the drug to be more stable. And then also we're allowing for a more sustained drug release. Another advantage of these, of these synthetic coatings is that they can prolong the, the release of our drug over time. And then this can cause a faster dissolution, which leads to a decreased amount of dosages. So now, like I said, the concentration is getting to where it needs to, one. Two, we're sustaining the amount of drugs that are being released. So the patient doesn't have to take as much drugs as, as we may have been prescribing them before. They don't have to keep up, upping their dosage because there is a sustained release and the concentration is OK. And then increased bioavailability, the circulation is good um, of the drug. And then lower toxicity, because before what's happening is because we're, we continue to give the patient higher concentrations of the medication, um, concentrations of that drug is building up in the body, and especially if it's not being released properly, we're having a high amount of concentration. So now with, nano, with nanoparticles and how they're sustaining drug release, um, we won't need to take those high concentrations anymore. And the, the, this will cause a lower toxicity, so we won't see side effects, because I'm sure if you your patients are coming in not only because of what you know, they came to their doctor for, but because of the side effects that they're having now because of drugs. And now they have to continue to take other type of drugs to emit those side effects. And it, it's a cycle. So with nanotechnology, we're hoping that it's going to lower the toxicity. And that's the main goal of nanotechnology, to be as safe as possible to the patient. So then I'm going to be speaking about regenerative medicine. And I have another video that I'd like to show you to show you the possibility again of nanomaterials. As cells differentiate, they acquire specialized functions. For decades, scientists believed this process ended with terminally differentiated cells. Committed to a particular cell fate, the ability to switch function irreversibly lost. In a major breakthrough, IPSC technology established the possibility of inducing plasticity to terminally differentiated cells. But several limitations arose, including a lengthy multi-step lab-based process, possible inefficiencies due to experimental conditions, low fidelity with which the final cell type is generated, and safety concerns, including potential cancer risk. More recently, scientists found that mature, fully differentiated somatic cells could be directly converted to another cell type by ectopic expression of specific transcription factors without the need to acquire intermediate pluripotency. However, this technique requires viral gene transfer, an approach which, one, requires an exhaustive laboratory procedure, and two, carries risks such as insertional mutagenesis, irreversibility caused by stable transduction, and increased cancer risk caused by long-term proto-oncogene expression. Therefore, it is not well suited for point of care applications. Thus, a non viral tissue nanotransfection approach was developed for direct cell conversion in vivo by Professor Chandon K. Sen in collaboration with Professor James Lee. This work has been published in Nature Nanotechnology in 2017. This approach is simple, does not require elaborate laboratory procedures, and can be used as a point of care approach. This approach consists of two components. First, a hardware component, or chip, fabricated for efficient delivery of cell-specific cargo in the URI model. Manufacturing of this chip has been scaled up to fit dimensions relevant to human need. Such chip has been successfully tested in preclinical core science studies. Second, the cargo itself, which consists of a combination of different reprogramming factors. Thus, by applying a highly intense and focused electric field through a range of nanochannels, this device then operates the adjacent tissue cell membranes and electrophoretically drives reprogramming factors into the cells. This new nano-electrophoration technology is distinctly different from bulk electrophoration. The simplicity and utility of this approach was demonstrated by nano-electrophorating the skin that served as an agricultural land to cultivate cells of different functional abilities. Using a specific cargo, a combination of different reprogramming factors, skin fibroblasts were successfully converted to endothelial cells 
and ultimately formed blood vessels with seven days. These blood vessel networks anastomosed with the parent circulatory system and restored tissue and lymph perfusion in two URI models of injury-induced ischemia. Similarly, using a different cargo, skin fibroblasts were converted to neuronal cells that showed similar gene expression profiles and electrophysiological function to that of cells in the developing brain. This tissue nanotransfection platform technology has the potential to ultimately enable the use of patient's own tissue as a prolific immunosurveilled bioreactor to produce autologous cells that can resolve conditions locally or distally upon harvesting. This simple to implement nano-electroporation technology generates favorable biological responses. It is a one-time treatment applied topically and only lasts for a fraction of a second without elaborate laboratory procedures. And it could have applications beyond reprogramming-based cell therapies, such as gene, protein, and drug delivery. So yeah, I could hear all the wows, that was cool. Yeah, no, I think it's amazing how you, like, you won't even have to do anything invasive within the body to now regenerate new tissue. Um, basically in that video, we're just putting a chip that has nanoparticles infused in them, um, putting them onto the skin, and regenerating the cells that we want, which is pretty futuristic, pretty cool. So regenerative medicine, um, it allows the repairing, the regenerating, and or the replacement of tissue organs. Um, you want to restore the tissue and the organ functions by delivering cells to problem areas and activating signaling molecules to support existing structures. That is the goal of regenerative medicine. Um, what we're going to look at here is tissue engineering. So usually how tissue engineering goes is it's done in vitro, so it's done outside of the body. Um, you can do it in a, a petri dish. So what you need are stem cells. So you can get stem cells from an embryo, from a specific organ, or somatic cells. And basically, you want to infuse those cells with growth factors, with hormones, and then also apply stressors, which I thought was really cool. You can, if, if you have an undifferentiated cell, you can apply a certain amount of pressure or a certain stressor that will cause it to then become the tissue that you want it to be, or become even the organ that you want it to be. But how nanostructures are revolutionizing this is they are creating scaffolds. So, you know, when you take those cells from the petri dish, you have to put them in something um, and then put them into the body. So that something is a scaffold, and the scaffold is going to come up as an environment. Because usually within your body, cells are in the extracellular matrix. So when they're in the scaffold, they have the opportunity to proliferate and to grow. But the issue with current scaffolds now are they're very stiff. Most of them are very solid. So they're not, they're not able to mold easily. Um, it's kind of an invasive procedure at times to put them into the body. So what we're doing now with the nanostructures is um, they're, well, I'll get into more about the, the, I guess, the newer type of scaffold. But basically, we're helping to increase the proliferation and the adhesion of the stem cells. So another issue is, especially if we are, uh, it's a big animal or if it's humans, a lot of the stem cells either run away or they don't stay put. So the scaffold now is creating an environment where the stem cells are going to stay put. And then also, we're controlling the drug and gene factor system. So like I said, it allows for prolonged distribution of the drug. But in this case, if we're using a gene especially, um, that nanostructure scaffold is going to prolong the, basically the, the environment for the stem cells to grow appropriately. So then this is just an example of us healing a burn wound. So like third degree burn, uh, we create the scaffold, the nanofibrous scaffold. We put the nanoparticles that are infused with the growth hormones, um, that are infused with the growth factors and the controlled drug. And then we are putting the stem cells within that scaffold. And then over time, we're seeing that the skin is growing. And none of this is invasive. It's just putting it onto the skin and watching the skin grow over time. So the new type of scaffold is an in injectable hydrogel. Um, and what that's doing is it's helping with osteoarthritis. So osteoarthritis is a destruction of articular cartilage. 
Um, it can cause severe pain during movement and a lack of strength. And I'm sure you've seen it in a lot of your patients that come in and you know complain of arthritis and you prescribe them and they barely can walk or they barely can move or they have a lot of pain. Um, in 2010 to 2012, 52.5 million adults were diagnosed with arthritis. So arthritis is a very, it's, a, it's, it's rampant in our society. So what we're doing now is we're creating a hydrogel and it's gonna be an injectable hydrogel and what's so cool about this is it's highly water soluble. So it's basically a shot, as you see in the picture, it's a shot, you can put it inside the body and it has the ability to mold once inside the body. So it's like a liquid at first, but once it reaches the target area, it has that ability to mold onto where we're, we're, we're targeting. So we're creating a 3D structure for cell growth, which allows for targeted distribution of the growth factors, um, hormones, and then materials necessary for regeneration. And then the benefits of this is it's non-invasive, um, it inhibits cartilage and decreases gene expression of inflammation, and it's biodegradable. So we can infuse a nanoparticle with um, materials that will keep the structure of the cartilage or the structure of the, of the system that we're trying to reinforce with new cells. Um, we're decreasing gene expression, so if you see in people who have high inflammation, INF-alpha is one receptor or one, or one molecule that continuously rises up, so n g nanoparticles are able to um, reduce that gene expression of inflammation, and then they are biodegradable, so that's another benefit of these nanoparticles. Once the use of them is done, they are able to degrade in the body, which doesn't cause harm to the patient. And then one example of this is using hyaluronic acid infused within nanoparticles along with salmon calcitonin, which is used to reinforce the structure, let's say, of your knee. And it's used to treat acute inflammatory response. Um, st still more research needs to be done in order to target it more for, um, for chronic. But when, when it was seen in the model, especially in rat models, we were able to treat acute inflammatory responses. And then there's also bone regeneration. So um, current issues, again, with the scaffold is they lack retention, um, especially of cytokines, and then growth factors degenerate fast. So we want the growth factors in order for the cells to grow to what they need to be, but their half-life is very, it's a very small window for their half-life. So once they degrade, we, we, they're gone. And then also, again, as I was saying, if you're a big-bodied animal or a human, um, proteins are another issue. You need proteins but the proteins also have the, uh, the tendency to leave. So the material is not staying put where it needs to. So this new scaffold that is being built, especially for bone regeneration, is allowing for deep tissue penetration. So we're holding in the molecules inside the bone so they don't run away, and we're infusing those molecules into the bone. And we're efficiently delivering molecules, and then uh, we're allowing for a low immunogenicity. So the immune system is, there's not a high risk for the immune system. The immune system is not going to um, see it as a foreign material. So that's another benefit of nanoparticles, depending on the material that you use. Not all nanoparticles will allow this, but depending on the material that you're using, um, there's a low risk that the immune system will start to act up and attack that new material in the body. So when it comes to repairing a fracture, in a paper that I was reading, um, it kind of gave us this walkthrough of how this works. So, in the nanoparticle, we have different types. Um, I've talked a lot about gold, which is in the metallic type of nanoparticles. I mean, there's polymeric, there's liposomal, silica, which would also involve um, those PLA, PLGA type of materials. And in this case, they use the PLGA nanoparticle and they infuse it with transcription two and bone morphogenic protein two with human mesenchymal stem cells. And so that kind of uh, gives us an understanding of the growth factors, the small molecules, and the genetic materials. They infuse that and they put that into the bone of the rat in this case, and they saw osteo osteogenesis was enhanced. So bone growth was forming just through a shot. So then there are nanorobotics. And I know I have another video again, but this one is really cool. I think um, everybody here would enjoy this video and explaining the possibilities of nano nanorobotics. This is a little bit, we are starting from bigger size as an example, okay? So this is a small bone capsule robot. Um, 
which has a camera on board, wireless communication, and it has, it has a camera. You think? Yes, there's a very tiny camera, the, the black one. So you, and you see the where, where where is the camera? It, it's at the end here. Okay. And then there are small magnets inside, as you mentioned, to manipulate anything you need some physical force. In this case, this capsule has magnets inside, and another external magnet can exert force from this capsule, and inside your body, this can be navigated. So it can roll inside your stomach, it can stop, it can go backwards and forward as a robot. Well, how would you put it in you? So you swallow it, so it's a, a pill swallow it? So yeah, this is computer minus robot, as you see in the video. Also, it's made out of a soft material, so that it can deform, and it's very safe to use, as you mentioned. Safety is our first rule about the design. And by rolling inside your stomach tissue surface, and the doctor can stop it, and then by controlling the external force, you can indeed eject that drug. Here you see this blue thing. Oh, wow, it spilled it, made a little pee or something. <laughs> and it can do this many times. And it can actively emit your body so that you can see where you want exactly. Do it again, do it again, do it again. <laughs> but first of all, uh, who is running? It looks like it's it's got a will. Like is, is, there some, is it being driven by something? You see that there's an external magnet that the doctor has full control of. And, and indeed, it's moving outside, but you, you use a magnet outside your body and it's moving the robot inside your body. Oh, so there's a doctor outside of you with the magnet and then there's this little thing wobbling, and so the doctor is moving it. Exactly, that's why it's safe, so that you don't have any, you know, decision. The doctor is squeezing out that blue juice. Um, so yes, nanorobotics are something that's so exciting. And one thing that I think you know, that was one aspect of nanorobotics, so you can swallow them. But again, um, we're dealing with a nanoscale, so we can also inject them. Um, and they can be co controlled by um, a computer wirelessly. So it's not that you have to actually be over the patient, but you can control all of these things wirelessly. And they've been used to help in certain areas such as HIV, um, cancer, and diabetes. And I know we've seen a lot about cancer, and that's really what um, nanotechnology right now is focusing on. But the goal of nanorobotics is theronostics. So that's therapy and diagnosis. So the nanoparticle wants to go into the body. We want to inject the nanoparticle in the body. It wants to now monitor the body and detect if there's anything wrong. And then it detects if something is wrong. It gives a diagnosis or it sends information to the doctor. And then right there and then the nanomaterial or the nanorobot is able to have some kind of therapeutic effect. So in that example, if you had cancer, um, it would take a part of the, the cancerous material and send it back to the doctor or actually cut through the cancer material and obliterate that cancer cell. Or if we see that there's something wrong in the stomach, like in the, like in the video, that nanorobot can release drugs right there and then. So there's a combined effort of the nanorobot. So again, it's used for monitoring, sending signals, um, destroying malignant cells, and then to restore damaged tissue. So how they work is through chemo chemical biosensors, which allow them to track tumors and cancer cells. So for some reason, cancer cells give off a large amount of e cadherin, which is um, it basically just allows the cells to bind together. And it makes sense, because a tumor is a whole bunch of cells binding together. So let's say that, nano, that nanorobot is going through the body, and it's scoping through, and it senses that there's a lot of e cadherin here, and then it goes in. It, it sees that, okay, there's an issue here, and that, and that information is sent back wirelessly, or the, it can be seen through bioimaging, so the doctor can now make a decision, okay, what do we need to do? And then I saw in another experiment that salmonella bacteria is highly attracted to cancer. So what scientists did is they took the salmonella bacteria and put nanorobots inside of them. They took those salmonella bacteria in the body and you know, they found the cancer, and then the nanorobots were engineered to release from the salmonella bacteria and then do its therapeutic effect, either cutting through the cancer cells or releasing a drug. And the benefit of this is it's an alternative treatment to chemotherapy. So we all know that chemotherapy kills the healthy cells. 
that's really the main problem when it comes to treatments of cancer today. So what this is doing is it's very specific. And that's what you're going to hear in a lot. If you listen to, if you read a lot of papers or you look at videos on nanotechnology, the specificity is what is the main benefit of nanotechnology. And that it only is specific towards the malignant cells or the cells that, or the tissue that is, is not good for the body. And then, like I said, it can easily detect cancers that have no screening protocol as well. So lung cancer was one thing. Again, it's monitoring throughout the body. It can be, they can use that to detect, okay, you know, for some reason there's something wrong in the lungs, let's go see what's going on there and give you a diagnosis at that time. And then, like I said, like I said send information back to the doctor wirelessly or through bioimaging. So then there is gene delivery. And with this one, I'm going to do a bit of a case study. Um, what we're going to be dealing with here is with ATOH1 gene. So what ATOH1 gene does is it allows for the growth of your inner and outer hair cells within your inner ear. And those cells are really important because you need them to hear. As you hear sound, the vibration is sent through your ear canal. Those hair cells then change that, that vibration into a signal that can be sent to the brain. So the brain can now register that, oh, I've heard something. But the issue with the A2H1 gene, if it's not functioning correctly, is again, you can't hear. Sometimes people are not born with it. And then other people, um, through some kind of activity or over time, the ear cells are destroyed. And the issue with those, with those ear cells is they can't regenerate on their own. They're not, it's not capable for them to regenerate. So once you don't have them or they're destroyed, they're destroyed forever. So I'm gonna do this case study of how we are using, how we use nanoparticles to deliver that gene into the inner ear to hopefully improve hearing. So 37.5 million people over the age of 18 report trouble hearing in the US. Um, two to three children out of 1,000 births report hearing loss in both ears, so they can't hear. And then the causes of this is, again, the damage to the inner and outer hair cells. Um, other factors can include loud music, autotoxic drugs, so drugs that are, are uh, toxic to the ear, and a lack of gene expression. So in hearing loss, there are you know, current treatments, but there are also challenges with those treatments. So the first challenge is the inner and outer ear does not take up medication easily. Um, since the ear is located within the blood-brain barrier, that is the hardest barrier to bypass with the drug. So the drugs that we're using, it's not, again, the concentration is not as high as, and as efficient as it could be. So the drug is not working as properly as it could. And then the cochlear implant and then eye ejections are used as well, but they're expensive. A cochlear implant can cost $50,000 to $100,000. And then an IE injection or an inner ear injection can cost $200 plus. So depending where you are on the spectrum, you could be coming into the doctor's office every six weeks, every two weeks, or however many weeks you need to. And imagine how much money that, is, that you're, you're spending for these injections. And then another treatment that is being used, but it's not very popular, is um, viral vectors. And viral vectors can be used to transport those genes into um, the DNA. We've been doing this. Transfection has been around. It's, it's proven that it works. But however, when it comes to the viral, using, using viral vectors, especially in the inner ear, um, it can cause the immune system to flare up. So the immune system is ignited, and then it wants to go to destroy it, and then that's damaging the ear. And then it can also cause cancer. So we don't want to really use viral vectors. So what we're going to use, or how the scientists use um, this information, they created a dendromer. So this is another type of nanoparticle, and you can see its core unit inside the nanoparticle. It's, it's highly branched, and then also the ligands. So why do they use this particular uh, nanoparticle? Again, it's highly branched, which allows for a transfer of single double-stranded DNA or RNA of any size. Um, an issue with the viral vectors is they only could hold a small amount of genetic material. So the payoff wasn't it, 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 is, it doesn't make sense. I'm using the viral vector to transfer those genes, but it's not even transferring a lot of them. If not, barely any of them are reaching them. But then I could have cancer. So they decided to use dendromers because they can hold a large amount of genetic material. Um, they're highly positive, which allows for electrostatic interaction with the DNA. So again, the highly positive nanoparticle with the negative DNA, um, it comes together and neutralizes the DNA, and then allows more access for the genes to come into the DNA. 
and then it biodegrades, it's safe. Um, it, the, once the use is done, it biodegrades within the body. So how they designed their nanoparticle was in four ways. Um, they used, again, that PLGA coating to make sure it's, it, it's protected. Um, they use a vector which is going to hold the ATOH1 gene. And then they use an enhanced green fluorescent protein. And what this is going to do, and this is another benefit to nanoparticles, is you can add a, a type of protein that's going to give off a fluorescence. So now we can track where that gene is if it actually did enter into the DNA or not. And then they also use transferrin, which is our ligand, and it's going to help us get into the nucleus and then reach the DNA. So the results. So this is our control. These are the results of our control. And basically what the control was, it was another dendrimer, but it didn't have all the fancy characteristics, the last four things that I mentioned. It didn't have any of that. It was just a nanoparticle on its own. And DAPI is... You, it's a dye that allows us to see in the nucleus. So we're going to be able to track if it actually got into the nucleus. And then, again, the EGFP is going to track if the, the genes actually did transfer. So we compare the control to our dendrimer complex. So complex is just, you know, we added so many things to the nanoparticle, it's considered a complex. So we compare it to the inner and outer hair cells. Um, the inner hair cells, we can see that genes did transfer. If you look at the green, the EGFP, um, genes did transfer, but they didn't transfer all the way into the inner, inner hair cells. But compared to the outer hair cells, you can see there's a lot of activity. The blue is showing you the nucleus, and the green is showing you how it's entering into the nucleus. So there was a higher activity compared to our control, which no DNA reached um, the nucleus. And then this is just giving you a comparison of the inner and outer hair cells um, compared to the outer hair cells. The outer hair cells did receive genes more efficiently. And then the real-time PCR is just showing that genes were incorporated into our DNA, or to that, into that model's DNA. And this was done on rats. Another thing that we have to keep in mind is a lot of this is still in research. It's not necessarily being used on the market right now, but it's still promising. You know, our, the main goal was really to get it into the inner hair cells, but the fact that genes were still able to transfer, even, at, even, even if it was at a low rate, and then also with the outer hair cells, um, genes were able to transfer, um, that's, that's a big step. So hopefully in the future we can see um, patients won't necessarily have to keep getting cochlear implants or um, have to get those injections. We can just give them this treatment that it's non-invasive, we give, or it's not, it doesn't happen as often, and it's going to be long-lasting. It's not just a temporary um, fix. It's going to be a forever fix. So in the future of medicine, I just want to highlight um, some things such as the products currently on the market. Um, since 1995, 50 nanopharmaceutical products have been approved by the FDA. So you can find nanoproducts as of now. And an example of this is Equivabone. Um, the bone, it's a bone graft substitute, so it mimics bone structure. Um, so again, if we have a fracture, we can use this to kind of enhance um, the growth of the bone. Um, Curosurf is a respiratory distress syndrome um, drug, and it increases the delivery with smaller volume and decreased toxicity. And then Doxo, which is doxorubicin, um, treats car carposy sarcoma, ovarian cancer, multiple myeloma, and increases the delivery to the, di to the disease and decreased toxicity. So the goal, again, is to make it as safe as possible to the patient. It's not that we're creating a new drug. We're just enhancing the drugs that have already been around. So doxorubicin is highly used for cancer. Um, it's one of the most successful drugs on the market to treat cancer. So we're just using that, all, like, its, its characteristics already and just infusing it with nanoparticles so um, it has a higher efficiency rate. So then the areas of growth of nanotechnology um, there are a lot of anti-cancer drugs and antimicrobial drugs um, in clinical trials right now and then also within that list of drugs that are approved by the FDA. Um, but there's still room for improvement and there's still room for growth, um, especially in the areas of the autoimmune system, um, metabolic disorders, and then also in psychiatric diseases. Um, I was actually shocked that you know, when it came to generative disorders, there's not a lot of research there. So there's, these are areas in which you can kind of see maybe what interests you. 
um, like for degenerative medicine, like um, multiple sclerosis or um, Alzheimer's or anything that degenerates anything in the body, there's still room for those areas. And then in the psychiatric diseases, there's still room for nanotechnology to improve in those areas. And then the possibilities. So I wanted to just highlight too, um, the improvement, there's gonna be an improvement of data collection. So nanoparticles will be used um, as a diagnostic tool. Um, they can detect chemical changes within the body and see if a person has a disease before any symptom appears such as cancer and HIV. So again, that's where nanorobots would come into play, being able to monitor the body before you even have a symptom. Because it's through the symptoms you're gonna know that something is wrong. But if we can find the issue before there's a symptom, then there's a, lot, there's a better chance that we're able to save that patient or uh, have a better effect of um, making sure that they're sustained over a long period of time and treating it accordingly. And then there's gonna be an improvement of bioimaging. So by using quantum dots, which is another uh, nanoparticle that emits fluorescence, um, these nanoparticles can improve MRIs and detect specifically where a tumor is located. Um, a color-coded system will be created, so once a tumor is found, the stage and the type can also be identified. So we can use quantum dots, we can use gold nanoparticles, so we can figure out that, okay, this is what's happening now, right now, we can see, we don't have to go through all these different tests in order to figure out what type of cancer it is, what's the size, we can all see that through bioimaging, through MRIs, increasing the, concentra the, contra the contrast of these, of these bioimaging systems. And then this system can detect broken or damaged genes within the DNA sequence. So a lot of people that go through cancer, after five years they notice they have cancer again, but they've gone through chemotherapy, they've gone through surgery, but the, the real issue is it's in the genes. And if you look at their family, a lot of them have cancer within their family, generation after generation. So what nanoparticles are gonna be able to do is detect that broken gene or that gene that turns on the cancer within their system and either turn it off or take it away. So this is a possibility. This is something that scientists are working on um, improving or doing in the future. So to kind of recap what I've spoken about, um, nanotechnology is manipulating materials to be at the nanoscale from 1 to 100 nanometers. Um, targeted drug delivery increases solubility, bioavailability, and pharmacokinetics. Um, nanoparticles create moldable scaffolds and help administer hormones, um, growth factors, and create an environment for cell proliferation. Um, nanorobots help maintain homeostasis within the body. And nanotechnology is the new wave of medication or medicine, and we should embrace ourselves for the change. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Excellent talk. Do we have any questions? <laughs> Who has a question? Right, right back there. Go ahead, just uh, speak up. I guess, now it's working. Hi, Dami, thank you for that lecture. So proud of you. Thank you. <laughs> um, I have a question regarding the hydraulic thingy, the injectable hydraulic thingy. Uh, a patient came to me and told me about that about a couple of weeks ago, and she said it was like a one day thing and she felt great and she was walking around, it was done on her back. And, and she said it was a cement like a cement thing, and I was like, whoa, okay, is that gonna go into the bloodstream years later, or is it gonna cause problems? She said, oh, the doctor said she, it, it, would, it won't do that. And then now your lecture, I'm more, you know, I understand more about that. And what I'm thinking about now is how long would that last? Because I definitely need that in both of my knees. <laughs> That's number one. And how long would it last, number one, and is it, do, are there any doctors in Tampa doing that now? Does insurance cover that? Is it expensive or how long would it last? Thank you. Um, I'm not really sure about cement. I haven't learned about anything about cement. I'm specifically more talking about nanoparticles, but I do know there's different types of regenerative things that doctors can do. Um, there's, can't remember the names right now, like PC something. Um, those last for maybe like two months at a time. 
and you can keep coming back. Um, but I know insurance doesn't cover it. That's one thing that I know. With regenerative like shots now, the insurance won't cover it. So, but I'm not sure about cement. Any know, other questions? Got yeah, one question. Oh, right there is. Yeah, there is a doctor. Um, what's his name? Doctor Axe. Um, he's located in New Tampa. Um, he's not an MD, um, but he's more of a chiropractor. But he does specialize in regenerative medicine. So, yeah. Great presentation, Thank very you. interesting topic. Um, the question I have is um, about the, um, the particles. You coat the particles with something synthetic, you said. Mm -hmm. And uh, the nanoparticles are biodegradable. Are, are those synthet what, what are those synthetic uh, things that you coat them with that protects them from the maybe digestive system? Mm -hmm. So there, there's different ones, but the three main ones that I know about are PLA, and they're really long names. That's why I didn't put them on there. PLA, PLGA, and PEG. So in a lot of papers, you'll see that they're coding those nanoparticles in order to make sure that the medication that they're holding is stable and that they, um, they're not degraded. Because when you go through the cell, um, enzymes are really quick to destroy a lot of for, foreign material or even genetic material. So we're coding those nanoparticles with those um, three different synthetic coatings, so they just get to where they need to get to. That's the goal. And other synthetic coatings are also biodegradable? Yeah, they're biodegradable. Not yeah. everything in nanotechnology is biodegradable. Some, some, there's, that's the thing. Like, there's so much research to be done um, when it comes to this field. But they're, for the most part, those ones in particular are biodegradable. DoKitaApp.com the apps that give you instant access to a doctor anytime, anywhere in the world. Speak to a board-certified licensed doctor using your mobile device, telephone, or text SMS within minutes. If medically necessary, a prescription can be sent to your pharmacy of choice. Register today. Visit their website at www.dukitaapp.com. NABN-TV, inspiring a new generation.